Hello and welcome into our notes for today. We are really focused on unit in unit 6.2, uh, how colonization really takes place and what does that look like in the uh, Americas, especially after this period of exploration. So in Spain, we see that the Spanish are the kind of first to start moving west that the Portuguese are kind of the first explorers, but the Spanish, they start to set up permanent settlements in the Americas. And the way this usually looks is that the Spanish, again, were conquistadors. Their job during this time was to conquer and take over land from people that were living in the New World. And this really starts in 1519. Hernan Cortes, really makes the mainland of what will become Mexico a huge part of the Spanish Empire. When he lands in Mexico, he is met by the Aztec Empire. And this is kind of the first interaction between one of the largest and most developed empires that existed in this part of the world, if not the entire world. And we start to see that this is heading in a direction of conflict. The Spaniards, though they're outnumbered, there's only a few hundred of them for a civilization that had thousands upon thousands of people living in the capital city. Uh, it looks like it would be an uphill battle. The problem is, is that Cortez and his men have three things going for them. They have steel weaponry that had not been discovered by uh, the Aztecs, as well as firearms that had not been discovered. And they also have uh, unbeknownst to them, brought different types of diseases to the Americas that are eventually going to cause widespread sickness and epidemic for the Aztecs. Cortes goes to war with the Aztecs, takes over their land, and by 1521, what will become present-day Mexico is under the control of the Spanish crown. This also means that they have control of the gold and silver that existed on that land as well. In their conquest, the Spaniards destroy the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan and rebuild a capital in the ruins. This capital will become the present-day city of Mexico City. And in these pictures, you can kind of see what I'm talking about here. In the upper left, you have the city of Tenochtitlan, uh, where a computer rendering of what that city could have looked like with its canals in the center of a lake with its uh, large pyramid-shaped temples, and the present-day uh, plaza in the center of Mexico City, now as the capital of Mexico. So to dive into this a little bit more, I have a video clip that I would like you to watch with this. Uh, I'll play the video clip in this video with the notes so that you can take some time to watch it. Uh, and there's seven questions that I would like you to go through. When Spanish ships landed in Mexico in 1519, the mighty Aztec Empire was at the height of its power. From their capital at Tenochtitlan, the Aztecs controlled much of what is now Mexico and Central America, ruling some 15 million people. Aztec palaces were as vast and sophisticated as any of those in Europe, and their temples rivaled the Egyptian pyramids. But within just two years, the mighty Aztec Empire crumbled, and Tenochtitlan lay in ruins after a brutal siege led by Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés. No great ancient civilization ever fell so far so fast. What happened to the Aztecs? For one thing, they had too many enemies. For years, the Aztecs used brutal force against neighboring tribes and city-states, forcing them to pay costly tributes and hand over victims for the human sacrifices central to the Aztec religion. Cortes turned these people's hatred of the Aztecs to his advantage. Spanish invaders also had superior weapons, plus guns, trained horses and dogs, and fully loaded warships that allowed them to overcome the Aztecs' greater numbers. Ineffective leadership also played a role in the fall of the Aztecs. Their emperor, Montezuma, believed Cortes might be the bearded Aztec god who was prophesied to conquer his people and bring universal peace. Unsure how to confront the Spanish leader, he was captured in 1520 and was later killed, possibly by his own people. 
his brother Cuitlahuac took over, leading an army that drove the Spaniards from Tenochtitlan. But the Aztecs then confronted another powerful enemy, smallpox. Brought aboard Spanish ships, the disease decimated the Aztec population, killing the new emperor and thousands of others. With the help of several thousand Indians, including Texcacans, Chalca, and Tepanec, Cortes and his Spanish force besieged Tenochtitlan, cutting off the city's water and food supplies. Despite a fierce resistance, the Aztec city fell on August 13, 1521. More than 200,000 people died in the struggle. With the Aztec Empire effectively destroyed, Cortes became governor and captain general of New Spain in 1522. Under Spanish rule, Mexico City rose from the ruins of Tenochtitlan, and Christianity spread throughout the region, replacing the temples and traditions of a once great ancient civilization. So again, as you can see with the video, Spain is able to make pretty quick uh, and destructive work of the native peoples that lived in Central America. They do the same in South America as well and build one of the largest empires, a collection of land that exists, uh, and a collection of people that are ruled by one powerful leader, in this case, the Spanish crown. When we look at this, this empire is gigantic. It stretches from the present day United States all the way south to what would be present day Chile, a very large piece of territory. And the way that the Spanish ruled this was that they tried to implement a social system that ranked people. Just like we've talked about social systems all year, these things are present, but the encomienda system ranked people based on their racial origins. Essentially, the encomienda system said if you had more Spanish blood, you then deserved more power and more status in the Spanish colonies. So those that were peninsulares, as you can see on the pyramid, were at the top. Why? They had pure Spanish blood and they were born in Spain. Creoles would have been of pure Spanish blood, but born in the colonies. And the further and further down you go, the more Native American or African American genealogy you would have. And this would be either as mestizo or mulatto, uh, where there's a mixing of that, or that you would just be full-blooded native or African and typically be slotted into some sort of forced labor. Now, when we look at the treatment of indigenous peoples, what we see is that not only the Spanish, but most European groups, uh, but in this case, the Spanish, consider Native Americans to be fundamentally inferior to Spaniards. And as a result of this, they do not have a ton of respect for their culture, their individuals, uh, or who they are as human beings. And what we see is that there's a forced conversion uh, of Native Americans towards Christianity, but we also see that there is a force to put them into forced manual labor, okay? essentially using them as slave labor in the Americas. Now, the Native Americans do not go quietly. They do try to fight this. Uh, there's frequent examples of warfare between Native Americans that tried to resist Spanish rule, but usually this was met with pretty uh, violent force by the Spaniards. Most Native Americans are going to die, though, at the hands of diseases. These diseases are things like smallpox that were brought over to the Americas by the Spaniards. And these diseases, because there was no natural immunity to diseases like this, it causes a drastic decline in the Native American population. As you can see on the chart, by the time we get to the mid-1500s, the Native American population has been decimated. There's very few Native Americans still in the uh, Americas in places like central Mexico. Because of this, we see a hemisphere-wide shift from Native American labor in the Spanish Empire and others to focusing on forced labor from Africans that were captured and then brought to the Americas in slavery. But we'll talk about that in another section of the video. What's important is that you need to know that competition for the colonies was mainly dominated by the Spanish. 
as you can see on the map, the Spaniards take large pieces of North and South America for themselves. This is the benefit of being first. They have the glory of capturing all of this terrain. Now, this isn't to say that they're the only ones that capture pieces of territory. Eventually, the English, the French, the Dutch, as well as the Portuguese will all have their own individual claims on places in both North and South America. These claims are their own individual colonies, again, to search out for the three Gs, right? In some sense, we're searching or for freedom to practice religion or to convert individuals. We're looking for glory as this is a competition for new land, as well as they're looking for gold or ways to make money. Now, again, each country has different goals, that their primary goal might be different depending on the different country or the different group that is colonizing. But again, what you need to know is that regardless of method and goal, they all impacted the indigenous peoples that were living in the Americas. And this also is going to impact greatly the development of the Americas moving forward into the modern day. The other main factor to take away from this is the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange is this global transfer that takes place during this time. Again, prior to exploration, the two parts of the world, the two hemispheres, do not really coexist. Because of this, we see that certain foods, plants, and animals have developed separately from each other. This then means that once we start exploring, new crops make their way to the other part of the world. So things like potatoes and corn make their way to Europe and the old world, while things like bananas and coffee and citrus make their way to the Americas. Now, while these foods and animals that get introduced are a huge change and a huge positive for many parts of the world. The diseases that are brought through the Columbian Exchange from the old world to the Americas is a big problem. The reason for that, again, is that it devastates Native American groups extremely disproportionately with smallpox, measles, the flu, and malaria.